Great. Okay, so walk, walk me through. This is, this is Fona right here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so Fotna, this is uh, one of our most exceptional sites to preserve a Fotna specimen. And here is a 3D printed skull. So the skull is one of the only parts of the body that isn't preserved because they're so delicate that they shatter like wine bottles. So what I did here with the skull is I found each of the individual bones and I used an iPhone to 3D scan the bones in high resolution. And then I used a video game software to reconstruct the skull and ultimately 3D print it the way that it would have looked like in life. But then as we move down the spinal column, you can see here is the neck. So these are parts of the neck bones. <clears throat> and when we get right here, these are the bones that supported the bicep muscles, right? So these are the humerus. And you can see that there's this really gigantic bump right here that would have attached to the bicep muscle. So they had really strong arms, but really dinky hands. Here's the hand, and it was really, really tiny. <clears throat> now if we move down the body more at the chest, they had these chest plates right here at the front. So we're actually looking right now at the surface that was facing the bottom of the earth. And as we move down the body, you can see here's the lumbar or the lower spine bones. And here's the hip area. But the hip is kind of hidden. Um, what we do see, though, is the leg starts right here. That's the tibia and the fibula. And those go down. And then there's its gigantic foot, which was kind of curled up close to its body, like a yoga position. And then you can see parts of the hip right here. This is called the ischium bone and the pubis bone. <clears throat> And they're really, really cool because the pubis is fused in the middle. So the bones actually attached to each other and became one solid bone. And then there's these really weird muscle attachment points. Or these, there's these really weird bumpy areas like on the ischium that may have been extra attachment points for strong muscles. So, okay, you, you jumped ahead to my question, or my next question a second ago. How do we, how do we know this guy's a new species? We, so I want you to imagine that it's Thanksgiving dinner, okay? And in one hand, you have a chicken leg. In the other hand, you have a turkey leg. And after you're done eating the meat, you hold them up to yourself, and you'll look at them. And you'll be able to notice that there's a number of differences, both in the size and in the shape of the bones, and also certain features. And that's essentially what I did with Fotna. I looked at all of its bones, and I collected data on every single bone. And then I traveled across the United States and other areas of the world to look at its cl most closely related uh, specimen. And lo and behold, I was able to see that Fotna had a lot of features that were brand new and unique to just Fotna. Yeah. Uh, do we have a sense of, of what role it would have played in its environment? It's a really good question. What role did Fotna play in its environment? Well, <clears throat> the, time that, the time period that it came from uh, spanned the gambit from, of the food chain from the top to the bottom. So there were animals that occupied every habitat from the sky to, uh, to animals that swam in the ocean, ran through the bushes, um, stomped around on the ground. And now we know with the addition of Fotna that there were animals that sheltered underneath the earth. And so because this environment was really wet and it had lots of rivers and lots of animals that came and scavenged up bones when they died, usually when we find dinosaurs here, we only find a few bones. Sometimes we, only, we can lame a dinosaur off of only a single bone. Fotna is different in that it is so exceptionally preserved, and all the bones are together and in their original life position. <clears throat> and this is probably due to the fact that it was doing the hard work for us by burying itself underground, and therefore it wouldn't have been able to be scavenged, and the bones wouldn't have rotted away on the surface. Yeah. So the other specimens we found, have they all been like this, essentially all articulated, they're all together just waiting to be discovered? This specimen of Fotna, which is the holotype, which is the benchmark for how we pit, pin the tack on what defines this species, <clears throat> this is the one that shows the best preservation. The other lo locations, some of the bones are scattered around, and some of the bones still have semi-articulation, like the foot is intact, or some of the bones are written next to each other, and then some of the smaller bones sometimes will get scattered and, and mixed around, especially if they're delicate bones. Yeah, gotcha. And, and speaking of delicate bones, coming back here to the skull, um, it, you, you talked about that process of, of scanning everything in with your phone, using that video game software. Was, was that just something that came to you off the top of your head, or is that a, is that a, a method that other paleontologists are using to try to recreate uh, fossils like this? 
3D scanning is a new technology in paleontology. It's really only become popular within the last uh, 10, 20 years. Um, but most of the time we utilize things like a CT scanner or X-ray scanner, which doesn't always have the resolution to pick up fine details. And a lot of the commercial 3D scanners like that people use for engineering and stuff sometimes also don't have the resolution and they also don't have, they also don't have an affordable price tag. Everybody has an iPhone. And the iPhone is extremely powerful at capturing photographs with multiple layers of information. And so by leveraging a number of 3D scanning applications with the iPhone, uh, you're able to capture extremely high detail of each individual element. And this is something that I actually presented on last year at a conference because it is a new technique that a lot of paleontologists are trying to use, but there's not a lot of good information out there on how to do it. Yeah, I mean, obviously the results, the results speak for themselves there. Um, looking at the teeth, you know, I, I was saying earlier they look like an iguana's teeth, yeah. right? I mean, probably munching, munching on plants somewhere out of that delta in Utah. Well, that's a great question. Yeah. What did Fotna eat? Yeah. Well, the teeth tell a story because we don't have its stomach. The soft tissue of these animals, they don't preserve. We only have the hard bones. So we don't have the stomach, but the teeth tell us um, a story about what it ate. And if we look at the teeth in the back of the mouth of Fotna, uh, we can see that they were really specialized for chewing up plant material. But there's something really weird in that if we go to the front of the mouth, right, we see that there were about 10 really sharp, really pointed teeth. And some of them were even serrated like a steak knife. And so we don't yet know what exactly it was using these front teeth for, but I have a strong hunch that it was probably hunting small critters like fish or small mammals or big bugs. But we just don't know yet. What is really cool, though, is that we think we've actually found some of Fotna's poop inside of the burrow. And so this would be a really cool direction to go in in the future to kind of investigate more about what its diet was like. I, I think um, in the release it, it mentioned that, that you all thought Fotna might have, might have been completely covered over with feathers or proto feathers. <clears throat> That's right. Like I said before, we don't have the soft tissue preserved. We only have the hard bones. So things like hair and, um, and soft organs, they don't preserve. But sometimes they do. Not in Fotna, but in some of its closest relatives, in amazing specimens, you can see all the filaments. You can see them covered in feathers. So we know that by bracketing Fotna within this family of dinosaurs, it most likely also was covered in a beautiful coat of vibrant feathers. Just for you, I mean, you, you, did you discover this particular specimen? Uh, this one, so we, there's been a lot of different sites that have been found of Fotna. Yeah. Um, Lisa found the other one, which is where the majority of the bones of the skull mm -hmm. has come from. I think uh, Lindsay discovered this locality, and then uh, we've also been working with the Chicago Field Museum, and they found some other sites that we have been using, that we included in our paper. Gotcha. Okay, so I mean, for, just for you personally, though, this is an animal that you have spent a lot of time with. You look down at this skeleton, I mean, what, what goes through your mind? What do you think when you see this? Well, it's been a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to get here, sometimes literally, because it takes a lot of work to get them out of the ground. Um, uh, but I am just so delighted that we can finally present this amazing specimen, this world-class specimen, to the public and to the scientific community. I'm so excited for the future of what is going to happen with uh, this animal and my research. There's lots of cool avenues. The next step for me is to publish the uh, complete cranial paper where I'm utilizing that iPhone to scan all the specimens. I'm also doing an interesting study on their growth because we take some of their leg bones and just like with counting tree rings, we can cut the bones and then count up the lines that they had every year. So we can kind of get an idea of how fast they grew and at what stage were the babies at and things like that. And then even more long term, the big picture I'm focused on is Fotna is part of a, a group of dinosaurs that we know almost nothing about. It is almost like one of the biggest black holes of knowledge in paleontology. And it is the family tree of these early animals, right? Because this is a plant eater, and it preserves a very primitive body plan. We're, we're very familiar with a lot of the charismatic dinosaurs like Triceratops, or the crested hadrosaurs, or um, stegosaurs, and things like that, and armored ankylosaurs, but all these popular plant-eating dinosaurs, they all evolved from animals that look just like Fotna. And so trying to figure out how they're all related to is foundational 
to our ability to carry out other investigations of the evolution of animals and dinosaurs throughout the Mesozoic. And so that's what I'm looking forward to next, is I'm going to be traveling around the world to do more of that comparative work and to capture 3D scans of all these animals, and then we'll put them into really advanced mathematical formulas that basically act like a Harry Potter sorting hat and will give, an, give us an idea of the real family tree. Very cool. The other thing that jumps out to me about this, you know, as you pointed out when we were talking earlier, sometimes you're describing a whole animal on the basis of one bone. Photonus seems to have gone from we had no idea it existed to, oh my gosh, it's everywhere. That's right. How, how does that happen? Well, we only started making the discoveries recently because the area of rock that we work in, in Utah, has been understudied historically. A lot of the focus in the last century in paleontology has been on in areas where it's easier to find bones. So the Morrison Formation, where there's really big bones to, that are easy to spot. That's one of the reasons why there's been so many gigantic dinosaurs named. It's a lot harder to work on small animals. You have to be a lot more delicate in the field while you're excavating them. You have to have a lot sharper of an eye to capture and see the bones. So the technology and the level of dedication in paleontology has really improved over the last few years. And that's why we started working on this area of Utah and are able to just start finding them all the time. Yeah. That's not a Desilosaurus skull, is it? That's right. I, didn't, I, I, I was thinking about talking about it. Yeah. Um, but the, you know, the thing is, and I, actually, originally I had them right here so you could see yeah. that you know, one of the really cool things we found out about Fotna in the later stages of this project is that Fotna is actually the direct ancestor of Willow, of Thessalosaurus. Mm. Yeah. That's what actually what is a cool thing that makes the connection with the Dueling Dinosaurs project is that Thessalosaurus lived alongside the Tyrannosaur downstairs and the Triceratops. Yeah. And so now that we know Fotna uh, lived 35 million years before it, we can kind of fill in the gaps in the evolution of these really cryptic animals. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, they look... That's, they, that's the skull that's in the CT scan in Reactive Oh, yeah. That's yeah. the actual skull that the models. And you can see just how, how much they grew. Well, I mean... Like 33% over the... Of the millions of years, right? So, I mean, it strikes me how much more robust that is. I mean, oh, this is, yeah. This is still, you know, it's 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 delicate. It's really it's really light. You got a lot more going on with the nasal cavity there than than you do here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and part of that might be preservation. Mm, yeah. I mean, some of these bones, uh, the skull bones, sometimes are just paper thin. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, the, the the hole might be a little bit bigger than it actually would have been. Yeah. Um, like here it's broken, this, this seems to be a more accurate reflection, but yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot that changed. These are very dynamic animals, and they're, oh, if, you, if you did a time, time lapse of their evolution, you can, you can almost see their bones acting like Play-Doh and, and yeah. morphing and adapting through time, so. Yeah. yeah. It's wild. <laughs> oh, actually, I wanted to ask you about the, the pointy little lower jaw there. Yeah, that's called the predentary. It's, yeah. a, it's a weird, almost like pseudo beak yeah. on the lower end of a lot of these plant eating dinosaurs and they didn't you know it's they didn't have teeth on them so yeah. the top teeth were just left alone hmm. what's cool though is that on these animals there would have been a keratinous beak yeah. like a, a beak made of like a, just like a bird's beak that would have extended off the tip of their snout huh. and possibly off the bottom part yeah. of their jaw so it would have extended their their uh, their face out a little bit longer yeah I mean, like look, looking at the the top and bottom jaw there together with those, particularly those front teeth, that's it's like a paper cutter, right there. I mean, it, it just looks. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? Yeah, and and sometimes you can even see some of the wear marks on the inside of the we call these the premaxillary teeth. They're the teeth at the very front of the snout. Yeah. You can see some of the the wear facets, maybe where it was occluding with the lower jaw, mm -hmm. also maybe where it was um, just grinding away down from from eating stuff. Yeah. So.